Hello there, it's nice to see you once again. My name is Makiza Micheline Latifa and you're welcome to today's edition of China Now, your weekly dose of news and current affairs happening in today's China. So Chinese President Xi Jinping arrived in Hanoi, Vietnam on December 12, 2023, where he held talks with the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam. you find out more about this if you stay glued to your TV set as Chris brings you details of this story. Another topical story for this week's edition will be the Central Economic Work Conference, which will set the tone for economic policy making for the coming year. Also coming up on China Currents, China has released the annual reports on the country's ocean energy development, specifically China's annual marine crude oil production, which has reached 62.2 million tons. Details of these and many other stories are tailored for today's segment of the show. Let's get started. China Currents is a weekly news talk show from China to the world. We cover viral news about China every week and also give you the newest updates on China's cutting-edge technologies. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to China Currents. I'm Chris. On December 12th, Chinese President Xi Jinping arrived in Hanoi, Vietnam, where he held talks with Nguyen Phu Trong, the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam. The meeting marked the third round of reciprocal visits between the two leaders and aimed to strengthen the bilateral relationship between China and Vietnam. Xi and Nguyen held talks to discuss various aspects of the bilateral relationship. Both leaders recognized the historical ties and mutual support between China and Vietnam, both during their struggles for national independence and in their respective reform and innovation endeavors. She stressed the strategic significance of China-Vietnam relations in a current global context of unprecedented changes. He called for a strengthened partnership that would contribute to the stability, development and prosperity of the region and the world. Both sides have announced a new positioning of relations between the two parties and nations committing to building a Chinese-Vietnamese community with shared future that holds strategic importance. After the talks, both leaders witnessed the signing of bilateral cooperation documents, which covered over 30 areas of cooperation, including Belt and Road Initiative, Digital Economy, Green Development, Transportation, Defense and Law Enforcement Security, and more. Overall, President Xi Jinping's visit to Vietnam showcased the deepening friendship and cooperation between China and Vietnam and laid the groundwork for a stronger partnership in the years to come. Besides President Xi's visit to Vietnam, the top news of this week is undoubtedly the Central Economic Work Conference, which will set the tone for economic policymaking for the coming year. As the crucial prelude for the conference, a meeting of the Political Bureau of the Communist Party of China Central Committee started on December 8. This meeting provided an authoritative assessment of the situation in 2023, stating that China has employed various means to achieve an upward trend in its economy. In the first three quarters, China's gross domestic product grew by 5.2% year-on-year, maintaining a leading growth rate among major global economies. The chief representative of the International Monetary Fund in China mentioned that China remains the largest engine of global economic growth, contributing one-third of the world's growth volume. On December 11th, the Central Economic Work Conference was commenced in Beijing, where President Xi Jinping was in attendance and delivered a significant speech outlining the country's economic priorities and strategies for 2024. The conference acknowledged that 2023 represented a year of economic recovery and development following the COVID-19 pandemic. By deepening reforms, enhancing macroeconomic regulation, stimulating domestic demand, optimizing economic structure, boosting confidence, and managing risks, China's economy made steady progress toward high-quality development. Despite a positive trajectory, the conference also noted several challenges and difficulties that need to be overcome to further promote economic recovery. These challenges include insufficient effective demand, excess production capacity in certain industries, weak social expectations, multiple risks, bottlenecks in the domestic circulation, and an increasing complex and uncertain external environment. 
The conference emphasized the need to enhance awareness of potential risks and effectively address these issues. Next up, the Taiwan Strait. On December 11th, the Defense Department of the Taiwan authorities reported that a flotilla of People's Liberation Army Navy passed through the Taiwan Strait from north to south on that day. The formation was led by Shandong, the country's first domestically built aircraft carrier. Taiwan's defense authorities claim that they have monitored the movement of the planned formation through joint reconnaissance measures. According to media outlets based on Taiwan Island, both Japan and US have also sent naval ships near the planned flotilla for further developments. This marked the second appearance of the Shandong carrier group in the Taiwan Strait within the month, previously sailing from south to north. Before heading south, the formation had been conducting training exercises in the northern coastal waters. On December 8th, the state-owned China Central Television released a two-minute video showcasing the processes of carrier-based fighters landing and taking off, demonstrating the readiness of China's carrier strike group in a high-profile manner. Many speculate that the flotilla is now heading back to its home port located in the country's southernmost Hainan Island. However, foreign media tends to depict it as a gesture to exert pressure on the Taiwan authorities, especially with the approaching 2024 election. Next up, on December 10th, China released an annual report on the country's ocean energy development. Specifically, China's annual marine crude oil production reached 62.2 million tons, accounting for over 60% of the national increase in crude oil production and marine natural gas production reached 23.8 billion cubic meters, accounting for approximately 15% of the national increase. China considers the stable supply of oil and gas from ocean as a guarantee for its energy security, and this element plays a key role in the country's energy transition strategy. In the report, China elaborates on the accelerating integration of renewable energy with traditional oil and gas. In 2023, the annual increase in grid connected capacity of offshore wind power reached 6.04 million kilowatts, representing an approximate 20% year-on-year growth. Therefore, offshore wind farms, which plays a vital role in supplying power for marine drilling platforms, have become a model for energy integration. On the same day, December 10th, China released its Energy Transformation Outlook 2023 during COP28, addressing energy security and cost-effectiveness during the process of energy transition. However, China's focus on ocean energy also leads to friction with neighboring countries, especially in the South China Sea. A preliminary estimation indicates that the marine oil deposits in the area reaches approximately 20 billion tons, intensifying competition in the area. Vietnam's state-owned Petro-Vietnam has been engaged in extraction operations in the area since the late 1990s. In 2014, 60 Vietnamese vessels, including Coast Guard ships and civilian fishing boats, intruded into the water of China's Xisha Islands, attempting to prevent China from constructing an oil platform. Next up, on technology. According to the latest data from China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, in the first 10 months of 2023, China's lithium battery industry sustained its growth momentum with total output up 31% year-on-year nationwide. Specifically, September to October, national lithium battery production exceeded 185 gigawatt hour, a 17% year-on-year increase. This includes over 38 gigawatt hour of energy stored batteries and around 76 gigawatt hour worth of power batteries installed in new energy vehicles. Total lithium battery output has reached 765 gigawatt hour in January to October, rising 31% from the previous year. Exports of lithium batteries also kept growing. In September and October, total export value hit 82.46 billion yuan, a 21% year-on-year increase. Additionally, all lithium battery production segments maintain high growth rates so far this year. From September to October, output of key materials like cathode, anode, separators, and electrolytes reached 430,000 tons, 300,000 tons, 2.7 billion square meters, and 200,000 tons, respectively, with over 25% growth across the board. Industry analysts attribute the sustained momentum to increasing global demand for new energy vehicles and energy storage applications, 
With continuous technological improvements, falling prices, and rising quality, China's competitiveness in lithium batteries keeps rising. Fostering the strategic emerging industry remains a national priority for enhancing manufacturing capacities. Next up, let's take a look at the overseas Chinese students. According to a December 12th report by Signs, a new Florida state law is preventing faculty at a state's 12 public universities and colleges from hiring Chinese graduate students and postdoctoral researchers to work in their labs. Passed in May and effective since July 2022, the law prohibits Florida public universities from accepting any donations or signing agreements with China and six other countries of concern, including Russia, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Syria, and Venezuela. Certain research and academic collaborations, including visiting scholar programs, have also been banned since December 1st. While students from those countries can still enroll in graduate programs, they cannot obtain paid research positions, including graduate assistantships or postdoctoral appointments. The restrictions currently apply to those living in or receiving a year or more of training, employment abroad, even with U.S. citizenship, unless granted case-by-case -case exemption by the State Higher Education Board. As universities formulate rules to implement this legislation, the resultant uncertainty has already frozen admissions offers originally scheduled for December-January to Chinese graduate applicants for fall 2024. The chill-in effect comes as Chinese students increasingly opt for alternative destinations beyond the U.S. amid travel barriers, surging anti-Asian hate, safety fears, geopolitics. Already, Chinese enrollment in America dropped 8.6% last year. Last but not least, let's turn to Huawei. Huawei France Deputy General Manager Zhang Mingang recently revealed that Huawei's first overseas factory has been set for France, expected to begin production by end of 2025. According to Zhang, the Huawei France factory will be located in the town of Bruma in the Rhineland region, occupying about 80,000 square meters of land. The 200 million euro project is forecast to produce 1 billion euro worth of output annually, delivering high returns while creating 800 jobs, including 300 in the near term and 500 longer term positions. The plan is projected to manufacture 1 billion devices per year, specifically 4G, 5G base station components like chipsets and motherboards to supply the greater European market. Since entering France in 2003, Huawei now operates six R&D centers and one global design center in Paris alone, enabling nearly 10,000 local jobs so far. France was previously Huawei's largest overseas market with 2.5 billion euro revenue in 2021, though environmental hurdles has delayed the factory announcement first made in 2019. In nearly 20 years since entering France, Huawei has established extensive operations centered around six research hubs and a global design center in Paris. The firm achieved 2.5 billion euro sales in France by 2021, created close to 10,000 jobs and captured 20% share of the French telecom infrastructure market. Well, that's all for today. Thank you for watching this episode of China Currents. If you have any thoughts and comments about our show, please reach us at the email address below. I'm Chris, looking forward to hearing from you and see you next time. Grateful to you, Chris, for bringing us these details. Balisa is now on standby with Threshold, where you get details of the most compelling technological innovations that have life-changing potential. Now, NASA is surprisingly urging their researchers to apply for samples from China's moon missions, especially the Shang-5 mission that happened in 2020. Also, did you know that China is the world's first country to achieve commercial operation of a fourth-generation nuclear power plant? I bet you didn't know that. Well, how is this fourth generation different from the previous generations? Lisa is the expert with all the details, so let's keep rolling as she brings you this and other tech-related stories. Hi, I'm Lisa, and this is Threshold in China. Today, we are going to share some exciting tech innovations and announcements that happened in China recently. On December 14, 2013, China left its mark on lunar history when the Chang'e 3 probe achieved a successful soft landing on the moon's surface. 
This marked the beginning of a detailed survey of this mysterious celestial body and made China the third country to have the technology for extraterrestrial soft landing and rover exploration. The landing site was later named Guanghan Palace, also known as the Moon Palace, which is the legendary home of the Chinese moon goddess and Yu Tu, China's first lunar rover. Its mission was to study the moon's surface, bridging the gap between ancient lore and modern science. The Chang'e 3 ladder and Yu Tu rover even snapped a selfie together against the breathtaking moonscape. Throughout its operation, Yu Tu faced extreme challenges, enduring temperatures fluctuations, and overcoming damage. But a push through, analyzing lunar geology, creating the very first geological profile of the moon's subsurface, and capturing close up photographs. Yu Tu's instruments revealed surprising insights, including a lunar regolith and a more diverse subsurface structure than expected. It traveled about 114 meters on the moon's surface. Even though it was designed to last only three months, Yu Tu persevered for a remarkable 972 days before finally powering down. But that wasn't the end of the story. Fast forward to 2019 and Chang'e 4 accomplished something unprecedented. It landed on the far side of the moon with the Yu Tu 2 rover. This mission brought us groundbreaking discoveries, including lunar mantle material, which is crucial for understanding the moon's formation and evolution. It sent back valuable data on lunar soil composition and space environment. By studying how the rover's whales interacted with the surface, researchers found that the mechanical properties of the lunar soil in the landing region resembled a dry sand and sandy soil with even better load-bearing characteristic than the moon soil samples from the Apollo era. And Yu Tu 2 is still operating today, making it the longest working lunar rover, cruising around the moon covering nearly 1,500 meters. In 2020, Chang'e 5 brought back the first lunar samples in over four decades. These samples, weighing 1,731 grams, include basalt and dust, they will play a crucial role in helping us determine the moon's precise age and formation history. But the journey of Yu Tu doesn't stop there. There are missions like Chang'e 6, 7, and 8 on the horizon, carrying the ambition of manned lunar exploration. China is preparing for lunar landings using its new heavy lift Long March 9 rocket and planning complex sample return missions from Mars around 2030. Let's continue witnessing this epic cosmic romance together as we explore the moon, Mars, and beyond. For years, a law called the Wolf Amendment had severely restricted collaboration between America's NASA and China's CNSA. But NASA just made a surprising move. They're actually urging their researchers to apply for samples from China's moon mission, specifically the Chang'e 5 mission that happened in 2020. This year, on October the 1st, China announced that they are accepting research proposals from international scientists to apply for the Chang'e 5 lunar sample. It's the first time they've done this, and scientists are excited. James Head, a planetary scientist at Brown University, says there has been great enthusiasm internationally to study the samples. NASA recognized the unique value of these specimens and has allowed their researchers to submit requests during China's last application round. They're calling it an exception to bilateral restrictions and want to ensure the equal research opportunities as foreign institutions. Even though there are still policy hurdles, Dr. Head is hopeful that this could be the start of an era of various levels of coordination, cooperation, and collaboration. But there's more! China plans to launch Chang'e 6 by 2024 and collect the first ever sample from the far side of the moon. According to NASA's email, studying these could be even more enlightening. They could go to the south pole of the moon where the resources are. And they could land and they would say, this is our exclusive territory, you stay out. 
Meanwhile, Chinese and American space agencies are also working on separate missions to collect and bring back samples from Mars, which could happen around 2030. However, an independent review that came out in September showed that NASA's budget and timeline for their Mars program are unrealistic and challenges remain. But on the whole, while geopolitics may constrain collaboration, for now, the future of space science is very promising. On the 6th of December, China's Shidao, one high-temperature gas-cooled nuclear power plant, completed 168 hours of continuous operation tests, and it was officially put into commercial use. This marks China as the world's first country to achieve commercial operation of a fourth-generation nuclear power plant. How is the fourth generation different to the previous generations? Well, generally speaking, nuclear power plants generate electricity using the heat released from the nuclear fission reactions. In conventional reactors, this heat is transferred by coolant loops to heat steam, which spins turbines connected to the electric generators. The first three generations of reactors are primarily water-cooled with ordinary or pressurized light water serving as coolant and neutral moderator. Pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors have both been the backbone of nuclear power since the mid-20th century. But water cooling brings some challenges as overheating could lead to steam explosion within the reactor. It also faces other issues like nuclear waste, limited fuel efficiency and safety concerns around meltdowns. The Fukushima disaster in Japan, for example, triggered a massive earthquake and tsunami in 2011 and raised global concerns over nuclear safety. Unlike its predecessors, the fourth-generation reactor is designed with inherent safety features and greater efficiency. For instance, the Shidao-wen reactor is a high-temperature gas-cooled reactor and it uses helium gas instead of water for cooling. This deals with the risk of steam explosion and also allows for higher operational temperatures, which increases efficiency. This enables industry applications like clean hydrogen production and higher electrical efficiency around 50% as compared to the 33% for conventional light water reactors. Another advantage of the fourth generation reactor is its inherent safety. Joint developer Tsinghua University emphasizes that in the event of a sudden reactor failure or external disturbance, the core will not melt. For instance, its specialty fuel spheres can withstand over 1,650 degrees Celsius without releasing radioactivity. Even in an extreme accident, the temperature inside the reactor is unlikely to reach this temperature. The Shidaowen plant in Shandong province is the result of joint research and development by China Huaneng Group, Tsinghua University, China National Nuclear Corporation and other institutions. With over 90% domestically manufactured equipment, construction began in December 2012. Grid connection was achieved in December 2021. And now this is the final milestone enabling full power commercial operation. Imagine being able to make a phone call and access the internet from anywhere in the world using satellite in space. Well, this summer, Huawei, the tech giant, has launched the world's first ever smartphone with satellite connectivity, and it's achieved with the help from China's high-orbit communication networks. China announced the completion of the first high-orbit satellite internet system, positioning itself as a potential competitor to SpaceX Starlink. This network consists of three satellites orbiting over 20,000 miles above Earth, giving them a very wide coverage area. It will provide internet connectivity for industries like aviation, shipping and emergency services across China and even parts of Southeast Asia, India and even Russia. Now, let's compare it with Elon Musk's Starlink network. Starlink uses over 50,000 small, low-orbit satellites that are only a few hundred miles up. These satellites offer faster speed but cover smaller areas, whereas China's high-orbit satellites cover a much broader area. 
Given their high fixed position relative to the Earth, three Earth satellites are required to achieve comprehensive coverage. On the other hand, Starlink's low orbit satellites provide high speed communication and low transmission delay. They are more resilient to disruptions if one satellite fails. In contrast, the failure of a high orbit satellite could have a significant impact on the entire network. According to Professor Sun Yaohua, who studies satellite engineering, both high and low orbit satellite networks will be important in the future. It's like the difference between cell towers and Wi Fi high orbit for widespread coverage and low orbit for targeted enhancement. So what's next? Professor Sun predicts that China will invest more in low orbit communication networks to power future 6G technology and compete with Starlink globally. This high orbit network is expected to facilitate communication for people in Belt and Road countries and also provide a valuable experience in maintaining and operating satellite systems, which is crucial for China's future satellite internet development. And that is all for today's Threshold. We hope you like this new section on science and technology in China. As usual, we welcome your feedback and thoughts. And that's all for Threshold with Lisa. It's now time for the Thinkers Forum, where we will hear from our thinkers and scholars who will share with us their brightest ideas about China and its relations with the rest of the world. Jean Auberg is a political science academic a peace researcher and the director of Transnational Foundation for Peace and Future Research. And he's going to be speaking about global peace and security, a very important subject matter. So stay tuned. Well, it's a general problem with Western perceptions of conflict that you divide them into two parties, normally the good guys and the bad guys, and then you feel an urge to say, we stand with this or we don't like them. Or you focus on a leader on the top, whether Slobodan Milosevic or Saddam Hussein or whatever it is. If truth is the first victim in a war, complexity is the second victim. It's hugely complex what goes on in, let's say, Ukraine, Russia, NATO relations involving probably 30 countries over 30 years. If you take the Palestine, uh, Israel, if that's even the right way to pronounce it or to describe it, I would say it involves the whole region of the Middle East. It's Iran and Saudi Arabia and all that and the relationships with Europe and uh, United States. So the moment you boil it down to say good guys, bad guys, we stand with one, you've lost it completely because the moment you take a stand between parties, you cannot do anything constructive. And that's why it goes so madly wrong. We've now had, since the Ukra war in Ukraine has started, this saying that this is a Russia-Ukraine thing and Russia has invaded an innocent country and all that. I mean, that has nothing to do with reality. Intellectually and academically, it's lousy. This is a much more complex thing, namely NATO's expansion, which all important leaders promised uh, the last president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, never to do. I repeat this because there's a lot of lies about it. It's well documented that Gorbachev was promised that if he got a united Germany in NATO, if he accepted that East Germany at the time part of the Soviet influence sphere into NATO, NATO would not expand. The formulation was one inch. Now, that is what NATO countries and the Western world and the US does not want to talk about. And therefore, they focus on this is Russia, who out of the blue, unprovoked, invaded an innocent country. Now, what was happening then was a very quick support, basically, by everybody who believed in that narrative to close off Russia and say everything is Russia's fault. We did nothing wrong. It was unprovoked. And so you had a black and white and very massive reaction in favor of Ukraine, although nobody seems to have known the complexities of Ukraine either. The ethnic cleansing, the destruction of the Russian language, the civil war which killed 16,000 people over eight years after the U.S. orchestrated coup d'etat 
in Kiev that installed the pro-Western government. So that was a, a, a much more simple thing in the minds of people because they were told that that narrative was so simple. Now, if you go to the Middle East, the difference is that that is a much older conflict. It's probably, I mean, it's in, in that sense, one of the world's oldest conflicts. And that's why it's so difficult also to heal it because those who live in this area have never known peace. Now, what is the difference here is that the Western world, and in particular in the non-West or the rest, knows the Palestinian issue and the repression and the apartheid that the Palestinians have been uh, objects and victims of for so long. So people are in solidarity with the Palestinians because of the overkill, the arrogance and the nuclearism of Israel. In both cases, they did, the, the, the leaders of the Western world did the capital mistake taking sides, saying everything is all to Russia and everything is good in Ukraine, which none of it is true, and pumping in weapons, using Ukraine to make Russia weaker. And we know why they want to make Russia weaker, because when Russia is weaker and gone, if they could do it as a threat, they can concentrate on China. So it's much more complex, but both cases they took the stand, I mean, Madame von der Leyen, immediately said on October 8, we, Europe stands with Israel. She should never have said that. It means that she is a conflict illiterate person and a person who does not know anything about peacemaking. We keep on arming, and I don't know how many hundred thousand people have already died in Ukraine because of these stupid policies. It's deeply immoral, and many of these leaders, government leaders, are war criminals, but they will never be convicted. Well, I think the great surprise for, for people in the West, particularly NATO and the European Union, was that they immediately, without thinking, without doing any analysis of the consequences, decided these barrage of sanctions against Russia. Now, Russia has not been suffering from these sanctions, but the West Europeans have been. And the US decided, and that's on public, both by Madame Newland and President Biden, that we will destroy Nord Stream. Nord Stream is history's biggest destruction of infrastructure and has had huge consequences for the economy, the gas import in Europe, the cheap gas that can, cannot get in anymore. And that's why Seymour Hersh's analysis of Nord Stream is basically censored away in the Western world because he's probably right. But they found out that contrary to their expectations, the rest of the world 85% of humanity lives under governments which do not support that policy against Russia. Like China, trying to keep neutral, but others too, saying, well, it was wrong legally what Russia did, but Russia had a reason to do it. Russia had said that it would do it because it cannot have a NATO member that close to its border with long-range weapons, two minutes flight from Moscow. Now, the Americans or the French or the British would never have accepted anything like that if they had had their countries there, where Russia is today. So the huge miscalculation of the West is panic decision, confrontational policies, and then finding out afterwards that, oops, what we did was counterproductive and self-destructive. And that's why I don't think that anybody is basically listening anymore to the Western world when it comes to Israel. The world knows that this is an asymmetric conflict where the Palestinians are, the, uh, as people, innocent victims. I'm not talking about Hamas, but the people, the Palestinian people, have been innocent victims for decades. And it's time to do something serious about it. And I, ho I hope that there will be mediation by the UN and by countries outside the West. The West cannot be a mediator in a conflict in which it is so heavily involved itself. You cannot be a mediator and a participator in a conflict. Well, the long story short is that there's only one organization that can do that, main, main organization, that's the United Nations. But the long story short is that the Western world has done its utmost, in contrast to China, to undermine the United Nations and not follow the normative framework of the Charter. We know there's a lot of bureaucracy and inefficiency and privilege in the UN, but the Charter is your mankind's most important single document. It's the only time where the world's governments have signed something that Gandhi could have written. And that was done because we don't want war evermore. 
Now, then people say, but ah, the UN is not very efficient and they couldn't do this and they couldn't do that. That's the wrong way of thinking. The United Nations can never be better or stronger than its member states want to make it. That was uttered in 1948 by its first secretary general, the Norwegian Trick Willi. And it's still fundamentally the most important thing said about the UN. If we don't, as member states, support it with money, clear mandates, all the things it needs, our best people, civilian and military, the UN will be a pawn in the game. If we don't deliberately avoid to elect forceful visionary secretaries general, and the last one was Kofi Annan, if we find it not important to accept something beyond our own nation states, we are doomed. And I'm glad to sit here in Shanghai and say China is always very uh, strongly emphasizing the importance of the UN and its charter. Now, when it comes to the concrete thing in the Middle East, there's a huge mistake made in thinking that this is an Israeli-Palestinian thing and can be solved with that and a two-state solution. Everybody now is back to a two-state solution, which we heard about for more than 20 years. Now, I wonder whether we should not expand it to the Middle East as a whole region and say, how can we put together the Middle East in a way that everybody would benefit, that it would be a win-win for all Middle Eastern countries, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Syria, what have you, all these also devastated countries, in which a Palestine and an Israel could find a way to live together with a Middle Eastern OSCE, if you will, Organization for Security and Cooperation in the Middle East, a kind of economic uh, community. The more, and that's the philosophy you have in China with the Belt and Road Initiative, the more we tie countries to each other economically, the less likely they are to start killing each other. So this idea of focus on Israel and Palestine and then either say, let one swallow the other or make a two-state solution. I ask myself, you make two states next to each other with the hatred that has built over decades. How do we know that a two-state solution will not end very quickly in a war between those two countries? Now, if you make a kind of security and peace arrangement in the, for the whole Middle East, and maybe tie it in with the European Union, if it could behave itself a little bit more intelligently, and the United Nations, a huge permanent presence of the United Nations, peacekeepers, negotiators, civil affairs uh, and civil police people. We need desperately UN missions, well financed, clear mandates, best people. And if we give that to the UN, the UN can help the world solve its problem. But it cannot do that with 6% of the world's military expenditures. This world is totally crazy with its priorities, its imbalance between militarism, weapons, 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 and almost no money for the United Nations. Don't ever complain about the United Nations, but look at what your own country does, economically, politically, in terms of legitimacy, to make the United Nations a strong organization. All the member states, there might be more and more degrees, different degrees, all the member states are still living in the outdated world of nation states. My government is the most important. I have national interest. No. Intelligent government leaders today know that they have global common interest, not national interest. We all have to give something of our own priorities before we can solve humanity's very important problems together. And there's no future if we cannot work together. Well, all too soon we've come to the end of another exciting, educating and insightful edition of your favorite news and current affairs talk show, China Now. My name is Makiza Michelin Latif. I can't wait to see you next week. But please do not forget to send in your comments, your thoughts, your feedback and suggestions for the coming episode of China Now. Many thanks for watching. I'll see you same time next week.